uh, Pastor Tyrone, Amy, thank you so much for allowing us to be here with you guys today. Uh, I think it was about maybe 13, 14 months ago we were here, some time ago. Uh, what, when was it? Eight Seven, eight months ago? Yeah, yeah, some time ago. Time flies when you're having fun. And um, it's good to be back here. I love the spirit in this fellowship here. I love the heart, the prayer, uh, as we were here praying early for, the, for our services here today. And thank you so much for uh, Tyrell for allowing you to be here. Uh, we came here a few months back, and uh, my wife and I serve with a nonprofit called Pure Desire Ministries. Uh, we are a ministry that uh, resources churches in the area of sexual addiction for men and women who struggle, or uh, those who've been um, betrayed by their spouse, uh, material that helps men and women find freedom and healing in this arena of their life. And, uh, you know, that wasn't my childhood prayer when I was a young boy growing up in church at Christian summer camp. Lord, make me a sexual missionary for the church, I pray in Jesus' name. And I can guarantee you it wasn't my wife's uh, prayer as well. But I like to say I'm a sexy missionary, you know. <laughs> but uh, my wife says those days are long gone. But uh, I'm glad you have a sense of humor here uh, with me here today. How many believe you can have fun in church, right? A little laughter. But I just believe more than ever that the church needs to be a strong voice of health in the, in the area of human sexuality. That our bodies are made in God's image and what God made is good. And uh, normalizing our sexual development. So my wife and I joined this nonprofit. She's one of our clinicians. I have served on the board of Pure Desire for the last six years. And uh, we authored a book called How to Talk with Your Kids About Sex. And it's a resource that we go to churches and proactively train young parents how to have age-appropriate conversations with their kids about healthy sexuality. How many know it's not the one talk uh, for 100 minutes when the kid's 13? No, no one likes that, the kid or the, or the parent sometimes. But it's the 100 one-minute conversations as questions are asked, as they're growing to see what's good and healthy about their humanity and their sexuality and giving them a, a healthy framework to know how to navigate this world in which we live. You know, um, I just would say for me, we cannot let pornography be the sex educator of our kids any longer. And uh, to me, this is where I hear the Lord drawing a line in the sand and helping us as parents uh, to know how to do it. So we talk a lot about how to help kids recognize that. You know, most kids all have a device like this. You know, I didn't grow up with this kind of device as a kid. How I many know what I'm talking about, right? The stuff we saw was chiseled on a rock. That's how old we are. Some of us are, right? It was old. We're old, you know. But um, it, in the world in which we live, we believe that kids need to know what pornography is, what to do when you see it, and how it can damage the brain. And help mom and dad become the safest people to talk to about that. Safe. And mom and dad know how to train and guide their kids instead of shame and punish them. Because sometimes they're only seven, eight years old, right? And so, so we, we brought some of these books. If you'd like to pick one up, if you're a high school student, uh, uh, come back there and get one too, because you're going to be a parent someday soon too. So it can give you a healthy framework. Uh, you don't have to be a parent while you're in high school. I recommend getting out of high school and getting married, then being a parent. But anyway, um, it can give you a great framework to do that. So thank you for blessing us and uh, last time we were here and uh, being a part of that. Um, I want to talk about prayer today. I'm going to talk about a few things. I'm going to talk about prayer. I'm going to talk about pride. I'm going to talk about humility. I'm going to talk about parenting. Uh, and uh, whatever else the Holy Spirit kind of brings to my mind. I'm going to talk about some of that too. One guy said, I, I preach like a fat man crawling through a barbed wire fence. I said, really, what's that like? He says, I have a point here and a point there. You know. So uh, today, uh, whatever the Holy Spirit puts on your heart, I pray that you would grab that truth and it would find good soil in your heart today as uh, we hear the word of the Lord. Well, uh, I want to just set a framework. I know you've been in a 21 days of fasting and prayer, which I think is great. And I like, you know, it was uh, one of the things that was a little bit funny, we were talking about fasting and prayer, and then Amy was passing out donuts uh, this morning, and I thought, man, I'm not sure what kind of fast this is, but uh, if they're serving donuts during it, I, you know, hey, I, I might be able to be a part of that. Uh, you guys can tell I haven't missed a meal uh, a time or two, so I'm doing pretty good. But um, it's so beautiful when we fast and just open up our hearts to wait on the Lord and see what the Lord has for us, and uh, 
and begin to share. And so I wanted not to speak about our organization here today, but just say thank you for uh, supporting Pure Desire. Uh, our, our mission continues to grow with almost 20 clinicians that serve on our clinician team and uh, thousands of groups around the country that God is opening up, online groups. In fact, every month we have 6,000 individuals that click on to get information on our group links. Every month, 6,000 people go to puredesire.org to find hope and healing. In fact, there's a movie that is just being filmed and they're just getting to the end of it. Um, and I believe it's, um, it's called uh, Undivided. And it is uh, going to be released on like a streaming um, uh, service like Hulu or Netflix or something. But uh, it's by Light for Life Church, uh, Light for Life uh, Productions. They're a Christian organization. And it's about a baseball player who struggles with pornography and how pornography is the funder for human trafficking in our, in our world. And this person comes to faith and has a transformation. It's kind of told in a, told in a narrative. But they decided to use Pure Desire and some of our team at the end of the movie to lead people to healing and wholeness. So think about this. Some will never walk into church to hear the good news and to find healing in a, an addictive area of their life. But they can be watching it on Netflix and all of a sudden they hear about this website. Undefiled is the name of the movie. That's it. Undefiled. And they can go to the website and it it's going to be set directly with pure desire and have uh, groups and information there to help people find healing uh, in the grace and love of God. So we're pretty excited about that. Uh, in two months, we'll be in Poland sharing with a four square church over there. So God just continues to open doors. People continue to partner with us. And uh, I love giving $10 a month to something that's going to change some lives. So you know what I'm saying? Uh, there's people can nickel and dime us uh, to death. It seems sometimes always paying fees for this and that. Right. And uh, I love giving and uh, seeing the kingdom of God be established. So anyway, thank you for just letting me share a little bit about the work and what's happening there. Well, let's talk a little bit about this passage, Jesus here coming. And he was speaking uh, to those who were confident of their own self-righteousness. Interesting. Uh, and look down on others. Jesus tells this parable. And the parable that was read today is two men go to the temple to pray. One is a Pharisee, which is a, a religious leader in the Jewish community in that time. And the other one is a despised tax collector. Interesting, the adjective used to describe this tax collector, despised, looked down upon. And um, Jesus says that the Pharisee goes to pray and uh, imagine going to the Tuesday night prayer meeting here that's being led, and it starts off with this. Lord, I thank you I'm not like Rodney standing right down here in the front. Can you imagine that? So the prayer is heard where the Pharisee says, Lord, I, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. And here's what I do do for you, Lord. I fast and I give. Huh. And it says that the tax collector, is, he was in the prayer meeting. He looked down and beat his chest and said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus said, I tell you uh, that that man walked away justified. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. How many know humility looks good on everybody? It does. You want to look good? You want to get dressed for your day? You want to make sure you look good? Hey, try on humility. It looks good, right? And let me give you a good definition of humility that I, I kind of like. Uh, here's a definition of pride, I think. Pride would be something like this. Pride would be saying, hi, my name's Rodney. Here's my strengths. Here's the things that I'm good at. And I have no weaknesses whatsoever as a person. That would be pride. Here's what false humility would be. Hi, I'm Rodney. Here are my weaknesses, and I have no strengths whatsoever as a person. I'm worthless. And here's humility. Hi, I'm Rodney. Here's my strengths, and here's my weaknesses. You with me on that? You're self-aware, right? How many love when somebody uses their gifts and they're good at something and you can see them exercise those gifts? It's a wonderful thing. When accountants, 
uh, do the books. I always say, praise God for people that do numbers. Can I get an amen? When Tyrone and the girl band, I call it the girl band because his daughter was up here, I think. So she did a great job today singing. And I hear her sing and I think, wow, she's gifted at that. But if you were here to me, me sing or lead the singing, you would say, Rod, that's not your gift, honey. Sit down. <laughs> Sit down, right? We're all attended something, but we all have areas that we need help and that we need growth in. So humility in our prayer, humility in our disposition. So here's the first thought I want to give us today is it's so important to realize that we all have problems and that we all need help. We all have problems and we all need help. Turn to your neighbor and say, I've got some problems. Go ahead and do it, would you? I got some problems. Yeah. Some of you wives are saying it's about time you admit it. Man, it's so good. I'm glad we got Rodney here today. This is going to be help our marriage, you know. If you don't take anything else, take that home today. Honey, I've got some problems, right? Let me tell you about a little story about humility and about self-righteousness. I, I can just tell you this, that no one in my family, my wife or my kids, have never bragged on my pride or arrogance. My pride or arrogance hasn't impressed anybody, trust me. Can I get an amen on that? It doesn't look good on anybody. But how many know sometimes some of that self-righteousness can kind of come up in us, right? And I always say, hi, my name's Rodney and I'm a recovering Pharisee, you know? I'm a recovering Pharisee. I remember going to a barber shop in Coeur d'Alene. I live in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. Uh, and sometimes in our church, Tyrone, we say uh, up in Idaho, turn to the person next to you and ask them, what part of California are you from? Because oh. <laughs> we're all from California. At least most of us are up there. But um, we came from Oregon, but anyway, via California. But uh, I, I was in Coeur d'Alene that day. We'd only been there for maybe a year or two. We've lived there now for 21 years. I got on my bicycle and I rode down to the barber shop. Anybody here enjoy barber shops? Any barbers in the house by any chance? Okay, yeah. I'll pray you one in. I love barber shops. Uh, and I went to this barber shop called Papa's Barber Shop. It was a new barber shop there in town. And uh, I got my bike and I got out and uh, walked in there and there were some people in there. And as I was sitting there uh, to get a haircut, never been there before, my phone rang. And as my phone rang, it was my wife Tracy who's here with me today. And she said to me, Rodney, could you come downtown and pick this and that up at the store and bring it back when you come back to the house? And I said to her, yeah, I can, I can do that, but I'm on my bike. And to get downtown's a, a few miles, so it might be later this afternoon for me to get all that accomplished. But if you want, I can do that for you. She said, okay, and I hung up. This barber, his name is Dave. I didn't know him. He, when I hung up the phone, he could hear my conversation. And he said to me, hey. Why don't you take my car and go down and get what you need downtown and just bring it back when you're done. Just be here before five because I go home at five. I had never met this guy in my life. It was like an Uber barber. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, you know, Uber Eats, this is Uber barber. You know, you get your haircut and get your urge ran and bring the car back. It was like, whoa, who, who is this guy? I was so taken by his kindness and his uh, just generosity. Well, I come to find out that... Uh, he owned another barber shop that used to be right here in Scottsdale, Arizona, on 72nd and Osborne. If you know that area at all, he used to have a Papa's Barber up here, and he relocated up to Coeur d'Alene and started a barber shop. So uh, I went and got my hair cut, and I thanked him. I didn't use his car, but I was so thankful for him. And, and when I get in the barber chair, sometimes I don't know anybody, uh, I don't let people know I'm a pastor right away. How many know what I'm talking about? Right, because it kind of changes the conversation, you know. If they know they got a, they're cutting, you know, they feel like they're cutting, you know, God Junior's hair or whatever. How people's preconceptions, preconceptions, thank you, of, of pastors are. So I just kind of put, keep it on the down low and just be this guy's friend. And I really just connected with this guy, and we got a haircut and laughed, and and I kept going back to the barber shop. I really enjoyed it. Well, one day I went to the barber shop and I had my my little son Austin. He was probably, I don't know, eight, nine years old. And, and so I said, Austin, I'm going to take you down to Dave's barbershop. And so we walk in the barbershop. And I hadn't been there in a while. And so I said hi to Dave and introduced him to my son. We sat down. And I looked over here on the wall. And there was a magazine rack, a magazine rack on the wall that I'd never seen before. So I walked over there and I picked up the magazine. Anybody want to know what, what kind of magazine was in that rack? It was a Playboy magazine. And so I, I grabbed it. I was kind of shocked because I hadn't seen these here at all before, and I put it back in there. 
And I thought to myself, well, I've navigated that growing up as a kid, but I'm certainly not going to bring my son to a, to a place like this where that's just uh, convenient for anybody. And I begin to think and build my case about why I'm never going to come back to this barber shop again. And I really don't want anything to do with this barber. And as we got our hair cut and paid and we're getting ready to walk out, uh, how many have ever heard the Holy Spirit speak to you? Now, sometimes it's a still small voice and sometimes it's a two by four. How many know what I'm talking about? Well, to me, it was a two by four because I had navigated pornography as a young boy and had to get help. And as I walked out, I felt the Holy Spirit say to me, Rodney, Barbara Dave is no different than you. And aren't you glad I didn't walk away from you in your struggle in life? Maybe I brought you to him so you could be a friend and help him. Can somebody get a witness here? Now, I'm not saying expose our kids. Don't get me wrong. I think we should protect our kids. Can I get an amen to that? We should protect our kids. But how many of you know Jesus was a friend of sinners? And realizing that the heart of God is to be humble. And in humility, we see the redemption and the good of other people. And that self-righteousness never looks good at us. I like what Mark Lowry, some call him a theologian, some call him a comedian. Don't know if you've ever heard him. He says this, you've heard the expression, love the sinner, but hate the sin, question mark. How about this? Love the sinner and hate your own sin. I don't have enough time to hate your sin. There's too many of you. <laughs> Stay with me here. How about you hate your sin and I'll hate my sin and we'll just spend some time learning how to love each other. Right? So that's self-righteous. Oh, this person does that or this person does that. And sometimes if we're not careful... Our faith can turn into self-righteousness and we can begin to distance ourselves and judge. I'm not talking about healthy boundaries. I'm not talking about protecting our children. I'm just talking about our perception of people who maybe aren't in faith or following the way of Jesus. I think this plays out too in our family systems. Maybe when you're having dinner or you see something on the news or you hear a story of someone who's made a mistake or having a problem in their life, maybe a young person or an individual, how your family responds to that problem says a lot about your family. You could say, for instance, well, let's just use my last name, the Wright family, okay? Uh, as my wife says, we're right, I'm right sometimes, but not always. That's what my wife says. If you hear that one of our kids or Tracy or I have a problem or make a mistake and it's kind of public, you could say, well, did you hear about Rodney Wright and what he did or his daughter did or his son did or... Or, or his grandson did, and you could kind of look down on the family. Or if you hear about a mistake that's made in the right family, you could say, well, yes, I heard Rodney's daughter or son or individual made a mistake. And you know what? I hope they learn from that mistake because I've made mistakes too. And let's actually pray for the right family or individual so that that mistake, instead of something that traps them, can be something that shapes them into a healthy person. Do you see the difference in the disposition of that? Now you're not gossiping. You're, you're actually showing your kids, hey, when you make a mistake, because you will, because you're my kid, I want you to know it, this is a safe place for you to learn and grow. And aren't you grateful that Jesus has grace for all of us to grow and learn, right? And so the atmosphere that we set in our home as we pray for other people shouldn't be in a condemning way, but a redeeming way. God, redeem that person, help that person. And so that would begin to be my prayer as I would pray for my friend, Dave, the barber. Lord, some way, somehow, continue your redemptive work in his life. Here's my second point. Not only realize we all have problems, we all need help, but start admitting our problems and seeking help. Ooh, I like it. Dr. Henry Cloud wrote a book. He's a Christian psychologist. He wrote a book called Changes That Heal. And in his book, he says this, you know, there's a difference between a healthy AA group, you know what AA is, Alcoholics Anonymous, and a judgmental church, the kind that Jesus was speaking of with this Pharisee. He said in a healthy AA group, or excuse me, in a judgmental church, it is, uh, it, it, it's not correct to have a problem. They're going to call you a sinner. 
In a healthy AA group, if you act like you don't have a problem, they say you're in denial. In the church, you go and you look good, but you get worse because you can't admit you need help. But in an AA group, you go and sometimes you look worse, but you get better. And he says, I know there are healthy churches, and I really believe the rivers, rivers here. You guys are one of the healthy churches, right? I really believe that. There are healthy churches and unhealthy AA groups, but sometimes because of lack of grace and truth, some Christians have had to go elsewhere to find their healing. And what would it be like as a faith community if we knew it was safe to show up just like we are? To say, I need help today. To, to a brother can, can, can connect with another brother and a sister with a sister and we can bear our burdens and pray for one another and confess to one another and encourage one another about our fears, our anxieties. When you, when you sang that verse from my mother's womb today, I was just shouting for you, right? Because I've, I've walked in fear and anxiety before and I love where we can confess that and find the truth. This is what I really believe. Healthy people seek help. And seeking help is never a sign of our weakness. It's a sign of our wisdom. Someone needs to hear that today. Healthy people seek help. And seeking help is never a sign of our weakness. It's a sign of our wisdom. So whatever the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart today, as you pray, as you fast, as you're believing God, God isn't just about God, what do you want to do through me? But God, what do you want to do to me? What do you want to do in me today? How can you continue to transform me into the image of Christ? Where is it that I need to grow? And I love when we have uh, friends and people in our lives that are safe, where we're in relationship with one another, and you invited someone else to point out any of your mistakes or anything that you need help in. How many know we all have blind spots? You know what a blind spot is when you're driving the car? It's that place where the mirror doesn't see it and you got to turn around and look or this mirror doesn't catch it, right? My father, who pastored in Modesto, California for almost 25 years, 94 years old, he just went to be with the Lord a couple days after Thanksgiving this last year. Just one of my heroes. And if I could uh, describe my dad to you, he's a cross between Billy Graham, Ronald Reagan, and 10% John Wayne. That's my dad. <laughs> you got a visual on that guy? Yeah. And I remember one time as a young boy, he would drive his motor home. I mean, you know, those motor homes have a big blind spot, you know? Hey, if your windshield is a prescription for glasses, you probably ought to stop driving your motor home. You know what I'm saying? And I remember my dad p turning to another lane in that motor home, didn't see his blind spot, and cars just honking the horn real loud at him. And then my dad would look at me and say, you know, Rodney, when you pastor in this town as long as I do, everybody knows you. And I would say to my dad, Dad, he's not waving. He's flipping you off. I don't know if you saw that or not, but he's, he's pretty mad about how you're driving, right? And a blind spot, we all have them. And when you have a good trusted friend, somebody that you have built a strong relationship with, you can invite them to help you grow. I love when someone that I trust points out my blind spots or areas that I need to grow, right? And say, hey, I don't... Have you ever noticed when someone maybe been in a situation where someone has their zipper down in their pants and you realize, hey, this person needs a friend right now, you know, they seriously do. And you come up and you whisper in there and say, hey, listen, I'm going to stand here and talk to you for just a second, but you got about 10 seconds. Go ahead nonchalantly and zip your pants up. And, and yes, I am your real friend. Thank you very much. Right. How many know what I'm talking about? Right? Just helping somebody. Yeah. The first time I ever spoke in church when I was in junior high, Tyrone, my zipper was down the whole time I was standing on the stage as a young boy. And I told my dad, I'm never going to preach again. He said, Rod, you're going to do great. Just check your pants every time you hit the stage. So we call that pre-check in our line of work. You know, just make sure you're good to go before you, before you get up and speak, you go. But when you have a good friend that you can say, hey, I've got a problem, can you help me? Or you care enough to be truthful with somebody. You can be honest. Sometimes I have a friend that says it this way. Uh, he says, Rodney, on the scale of one to 10, how honest do you want me to be with you? Right? Yeah. If it's 10, it means bring it on full board. Just tell it like it is. But how many know some days you can't handle 10? Yeah. You're a little fragile. I say, hey, give me a four and a half. Just whatever, you, help, help me. Make it a little bit more palatable for me. But to love is to have someone's best interest and to care for people is to really want to help them grow. 
in our prayers we can do that. Well, my final thought here is this, to trust that God has nothing but our best interest. Think about it. Two people went to pray, a Pharisee and a tax collector. How many people had problems in this scenario? One or two? They both had problems, didn't they? On the story of the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15, how many sons were lost? One or two? Two were lost. One was just lost at home, but he didn't, but he didn't understand the goodness of the father. And one was lost outside of the home, right? I, I, I'm a PK. I know what it's like to be lost inside a church. Can I get an amen? And grateful for the grace of God that helps us and heals us and trusting. The tax collector hit his chest. God have mercy on me, a sinner. Trusted that God had his best interest. I don't know what your perspective is of God or the divine. I hope that you would really realize that God is exactly like Jesus. That Jesus didn't come to save us from God. Jesus came to reveal God as Savior. Think about that. Jesus didn't come to protect us from an angry, vengeful, wrathful God. Jesus came to reveal in his personhood who God is like. Loving, gracious, truthful, the friend of sinners, redemptive. And this is why people were drawn to Jesus so much. And he was known as a friend of sinners because he was always showing them the better way to live this life. Jesus showed us how to be fully human. And I like to say it, and this may offend some of you, but I think you're uh, mature and can forgive me. Jesus didn't come to sell hell insurance. Jesus came to help us with the hell we're living in here and now because of the deceitfulness of sin and show us the better way to live right here and right now to establish what he called the kingdom of God within us here and now to help us. So let me take you back to my story with my barber, Dave. I had been a friend with Dave about a year and a half later. I still went to the barber shop and he said to me, Rodney, he said, I found out you were a preacher the other day. I said, well, it's true, yeah. He said, I'd like to come to your church. I said, great, we'll come. So he comes to my church one Sunday, and it just happened to be the Sunday that I was teaching. And uh, how many know when you bring a friend to church and it's their first time to come, you say, oh, Lord, don't let Tyrone drop the ball today. Help him to have a good sermon, Lord, because this is my friend. Lord, let him be anointed. Don't let him be, Lord, help us. You know, help us. How many know what I'm talking about, right? Here we go, Lord. And my friend came and I was speaking. At the end of the service, Dave came to me and said, Rodney, you're the same guy on that stage as you are in my barber chair. And I said to him, well, that wasn't always the case with me. I've had a lot of growing in my life to do. And guess what? He didn't come back to the church for three years after that. <laughs> Praise God, I guess, right? Just when you think you got a fish in the boat, boom, it hops out of the boat. But you know what? It wasn't about him walking in a building. Yes. He wasn't an agenda or a notch on my belt. He was a friend that mattered to God. And so I just kept going. Dave navigated a couple divorces in his life. He switched barber shops and went to this barber shop to another barber shop. And I noticed that that magazine rack never got put back up on the wall there. And those magazines were never there. And I said to one of his friends who worked with him, is actually uh, one, of his, uh, one of his wives that he married, hey, I noticed Dave doesn't have those magazines. And she says, no, he doesn't bring those out anymore. Those aren't out. So it was three years later, Dave walks into church on a Sunday morning, puts his cigarette out in the ashtray. Uh, I recommend having ashtrays so that, you know, we can uh, not just have them in the parking lot. You know what I mean? That, yeah, never mind. I don't know why I said that, but... Uh, <laughs> He comes in. I said, Dave, it's so great to see you. And when he came in, I heard the Spirit of God say something to me. And this is what I love about what Amy's doing about coming to prayer, learning to tune in the voice of God. I've learned that my prayers as I get older become less talking and more listening. God, where are you at work and how can I join you? And I felt the Spirit of God say to me, Rodney, invite David to the missions trip to Honduras. We're taking a medical team and a dental team and a feeding team and an evangelism team. 
I want you to take Dave and set up a barbershop team and give haircuts. This thought just hit me. So Dave comes in and I said to him, hey, Dave, you and I've had people praying for us most of our lives. How about we be the answer to someone's prayer? I got a group here in a few months going down to Honduras. We're going to do some medical brigade and help out some people down there. How about you and I go down there and set up a barber shop and we can cut hair for a week together? And he looked at me and tears started coming down his eyes. He said, Rod, no one has ever asked me to do something like that ever in my life. He said, I'd love to go. I said, you would? He said, yeah, I'll go with you. I said, that's great. That's fantastic. And then he went on in the service and there was a buddy of mine, Brandon, who's in my small group. And I went over to him and I said, Brandon, that was Barbara Dave. And he said, oh, yeah, we've been praying for Barbara Dave. I remember that story. I said, well, he just said he would go to Honduras with me on the mission trip. He did? Yeah. I said, but I'm not even signed up to go on the mission trip. <laughs> and my friend Brandon says, well, you are now. And, and he wrote a check for the price to me to go on that mission trip right there. And then you're supposed to go. So I called the doctor, Dr. Brett Dirks, and said, Brett and Michelle, I've got this friend, Dave. He's a barber. He's a friend of mine. He's been coming. I'd love to go down there, and him and I give haircuts while you guys are doing these different things with the, with the community down there. And they said, that'd be great. So as I'm talking to Dave about this, and we get our vaccination, and we're doing all this together, it's about a week before this trip is about to take off. And Dave calls me, and he says, uh, hey, Rodney, let's get together for lunch. I need to talk to you. So I said, sure. So we went down to this little sandwich shop called uh, Little Papetta's at the time. And uh, we were having a sandwich. And he looked at me and he said, Rodney, he says, I really can't go on this mission trip with you. He said, uh, you know, we're getting to know each other. But he said, uh, I don't want to con you. I've conned a lot of people in my life, he said. But I don't want to con you. He said, I really can't be a good Christian he said, you know, these people that are helping us on this missions trip, like the doctor and the doctor's wife, Brett and Michelle and Efton and Darley, named a bunch of names. He said, these are really good people and they're good Christians, but you just need to know I can't be a good Christian. And I said, Dave, I know those people. They're not near as good as you think. They're not, they're not that good. And he laughed just like that. And I said, Dave, this whole thing isn't about you and I trying to be a good Christian. It's not about how good we can be. You're missing the whole boat. The boat is just connecting to love and letting love begin to change your heart from the inside out. And doing things not because you have to, but because you want to. And allowing God to bring people and resources that show you the better way. And he said, well, that's already happening to me. And I said, well, tell me about that. He said, well... I never really cared for church much, but now I can't wait to go to church because it's like a family reunion. I love being there. And it was beautiful just to hear. So he said, Rodney, as long as you know that I can't measure up to some standard of righteousness, I will continue to go and I'll go. So we went to Honduras. The first day we cut 76 heads of hair, the first day. And at my station, I just had one cut. You got it all shaved off. I got all the six-year-old boys. They just brought them right to me, and I just would shave their head. I just had one, one style, you know what I mean? And, uh, and I'll never forget it. Dave down there, just so hot and humid, cigarette hanging out of his mouth as he's cutting hair. And I'm just thinking, Lord, don't let him have a heart attack. I'll have to give him mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation and validate my love for you, you know? And at night, he was my roommate, and we would sit out on the porch and talk. And he talked about his journey of life. Grew up in New Jersey. When he was a young boy, his dad was pretty abusive to him. Would literally take two by fours to him. Ran away when he was 15. Lived on the streets. Used to steal bread out of the bread trucks just to kind of survive and get through. He had had a real hard journey. You know, when you learn people's backstory, when you learn their history, it can give you more empathy and compassion and love because so, so many times our addictive, destructive behaviors are, are traumas and pains that we've had that we never know how to process. We've never found safe people to, to cry and grieve and process some of those things. And that was Dave's story. And I'll never forget it. We got back and a few months later, his daughter was talking to him on the phone, Kelly, his first child. 
She said, Dad, there's something different about you. Can I come out and visit you? She was from the East Coast. And he said, yeah. So she came out and she spent some time with her dad. And she said, uh, uh, man, he's, he's really changed. He's really different. And uh, she called her mom and said, Mom, uh, Dave's first wife. Mom, you got to come see Dad, Dave. I mean, he's, I can't even believe it, but there's a real change that has happened in his life. You got to come witness this. So she flew out, and Dave was not married at the time, and she stayed with him for a couple months and couldn't believe the witness. Kelly told me a little bit more of the backstory, his daughter, and how when she was a young girl, Dave was hurt by, hurt his daughter the way he got hurt. And so we had a moment where she and I went to him and said, Dad, when I was a little girl, you did some things that really hurt me. And Dave looked at her and said, I did, and I'm sorry for that. And he said, I could never forgive myself for what I did. But he said, there was a day I was in church and Pastor Mike talked about the cross of Christ and how Christ came to love us and forgive us and to heal us. And he said, we, we came down to the cross and we wrote things on cards, just like you guys have here, and we nailed them to the cross. And he said, that day I asked God not only to forgive me, but I asked God to help me forgive myself. And there was a moment of time where a daughter who had been wounded by her father could confront. And when two people forgive each other, that's when you can move toward reconciliation. And so not only was there healing from her, but healing to him. And it was a beautiful thing just to witness that Dave realized that I hadn't managed my life in healthy ways and I'd hurt those that I loved. I say that to say some of you here maybe will never have a perpetrator or someone that hurt you ever have the courage to say that, but you can hear the voice of God. It wasn't your fault today. That's not something that should be put on you. That was someone else's brokenness that touched you. And you are a child of God, deeply loved and deeply cared for. And you are the beloved of God. Dave had kidney failure. He was in his late 70s. And he was in the hospital on life support. His first wife said to me, she had a New Jersey accent. And she called me Padre because I was a pastor. She was Catholic. So she said, hey, Padre, hey, Padre, I want you to come with me to the hospital because we're going to unplug Dave and he, we're, he's going to die. I said, OK. So we're sitting there at Kootenai Medical Center in the ER and she says, Padre, Padre, I want you to know you got your miracle. You got your miracle, Padre. Well, in the Catholic faith, if you have uh, experienced a tremendous miracle, they call you saint. Have you heard of Saint Francis or Saint Mother Teresa? You're Saint Rodney, she said. You got your miracle. She said, I knew this guy back in New Jersey. He was not a good guy. But I just met him, but I got to reconnect with him these last year, and I can't believe the transformation that happened in his life. And I said to her, well, don't just thank me because as we developed a friendship, I was raising my three kids, and many times he would encourage me about how to be a good parent, learning from some of his mistakes, things that I could do better. How do you know that the gospel is always relational? It's always a two-way street. When you go to serve someone else, if your heart's open, sometimes you get the bigger blessing back to you. And so prayer. And so we unplugged the machine, we said goodbye to Dave, and as I think back about that story, about the prayers I said for my friend, I go all the way back to that barbershop when I had a little self-righteousness in me thinking, I don't want anything to do with this guy. And then I realized, oh, we're all the same. God's trying to heal all of us. And I said yes to participating with God to be the answer to someone's prayer today. So as we conclude here today, you know, the scripture that came to my mind even when we were praying this morning was Luke 19, 10, where Jesus said, for the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. This really is the heartbeat of the divine. Hear me with this as I close. Jesus didn't come to start another religion called Christianity. Jesus came to heal humanity because everybody matters to God. And as we are the body of Christ, we can say to people, hey, there's a seat at the table here for you. 
There's a place where you can come and grow and find help and find healing, the redemptive work of Christ. So would you do me a favor and stand as uh, we get ready to sing? But I want to say a prayer for us today. Just bow your head with me if you would. And let me pray over you. Heavenly Father, thank you for the Rivers Fellowship. Thank you, uh, not just for the building and the stage and the microphone and the music, but thank you for the men and women that make up, that is the body of Christ. Someday in a hundred years, who knows what this building will be, but the body of Christ, we believe will be strong and growing and redemptive to do your work here on earth. God, I pray today that we would be reminded of your words, that you resist the proud, but you give grace to the humble. And Lord, like the tax collector who really had made mistakes, you had grace to help them grow. Like Barbara Dave, you had grace to help them grow. Like the Pharisee in the story, Jesus, you met Pharisees like Nicodemus and other Pharisees became followers of you that scripture speaks about, and there was grace for them to grow. So Father, Thank you for having grace for Rodney to grow and to participate with you. As a family of faith in our homes, may we continue to move toward health and healing and wholeness, God. I pray as we lift our voices in song here in this final chorus, I pray that as you're speaking to us, God, we would let you take that truth and just drive it in our hearts and that we would be obedient to take that next step that you're calling us to, that we could participate in your redemptive work. I ask this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.